hand in hand The line extends all around the nine-mile fence Thirty thousand women chant Bring the message home Carry green and home Yes, near home and far away Carry green and home If we're trying to win a popularity contest, as you'll see from all of the women that we cite, well, none of them won a, co a popularity contest either, but they were all pretty effective. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about the song you heard as you were arriving. I hope you heard it. Some of you will have realised that that was Peggy Seeger um, leading the singing. And there's um, a couple of lines I want to pick out particularly um, that connect to the stuff that Rowan and I are going to be talking about. Um, one of them was Iron Fist in Velvet Glove, and the follow-on line was help to save the world we love. And I, had, I hadn't heard that song for ages, and, and when I heard those two words, I thought, when I heard those two lines, I thought that absolutely summarises, you know, that, that we're, we're going to go about this non-violently with a really good velvet glove on, and that the world we love is disappearing literally before our eyes. And so now is the time to act. Um, you didn't see her talking after singing. She also spoke about the magnificence of the green and women and uh, the fact that the, the, the stuff, the, the missiles went from the common um, after their long occupation, which we're gonna talk more about shortly. And she talked about winning the battle and not the war. And that feels like where we are really, you know, that we've won the battle in April, 2019 to get the climate emergency declared. Um, and we win other little battles here and there, but the main battle, the main war, we're still not winning. So that's, that's what this is about. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to Elizabeth Lilburn. Um, most of the time you'll be watching something more interesting than talking heads. Um, but I'm just going to talk about Elizabeth Lilburn. Um, she was uh, a leveller um, in the 1650s. And the, part, the movement that she was a part of, they were called levellers because 50 years earlier, uh, some rural people in the Midlands had levelled the fences and hedges that were enclosing their commons. So they were no longer able to graze their animals and um, grow food on what had previously been common lands. So, you know, you can hear already the beginning of a theme here. Um, and um, Elizabeth Lilburn was a really remarkable woman. And uh, she was married to John Lilburn, who was one of the Leveller's leaders. And she joined him in prison. Um, in the 1650s. And what was especially remarkable about that was that she was heavily pregnant with their first child at the time. Um, and when I was researching this, I discovered that Pretty Patel must have been researching exactly the same bit of history as I was, because the immigration policy that she's designing, and that's only to stop a few hundred people trying to get to the UK, not the many thousands that the climate catastrophe will cause, has much in common with the parliamentary troops. When Elizabeth and John were in prison and when Elizabeth was, was giving birth, uh, the parliamentary troops were sent into her house and they stole the linen that was there for her lying in, the linen that she was having for her home birth. So I realized when I read that, that Priti Patel must also be studying the mid 17th century, but she was taking a different lesson from it than I think we will. Uh, and the other thing about her was that she carried on fighting throughout her life. It's a bit difficult to untangle what the winds were because the levelers were calling for equality before the law, but not equality of gender. They were calling for the equality of being able to practice their Protestant religion. And it's, it's a bit kind of mixed up with the other things that, that uh, happened. Um, but they were, they were the few who stepped forward and said the things that are happening are not right. Um, and she carried on speaking, uh, going back to prison, giving out 
leaflets, writing booklets, all sorts of stuff. And while she was doing that, guys, she had 10 children, 10 children, only three of whom made it to adulthood. And that for me is almost as hard to hear as some of the stuff that Gabby was saying. And it's good, isn't it, to think about how courageous she was and how courageous we will be. Once a fortnight outside the Royal Ordnance Factory at Llanishan in Cardiff, a small group of women gather to stage what is now a familiar protest, a protest against nuclear weapons. These are the women for life on Earth. The factory has become their latest target because it is claimed it manufactures components for nuclear weapons, the bomb. People who work here, I think they should know, well, they probably do know some of the risks they're running, but I think it's time that um, there was a debate about it, that things were made common knowledge, that people in the area knew exactly what's going on. And they have been leafleted with the, um, the leaflet that Linish and CND have brought out. And I think it's very important that everyone in Cardiff realises what exactly is going on here, that we find out more. The Official Secrets Act stops us finding out um, all but the very basic information that we've got already. And we don't think this is reasonable in, in this capital city of nuclear-free Wales. The Women's Peace Campaign has its origins in a march which began in Cardiff in the summer of last year. It started in almost carnival fashion, but it was to develop into a sustained campaign against nuclear arms. The destination of the protesters was the RAF base at Greenham Common in Berkshire, one of a number of sites chosen for the deployment of cruise missiles in Britain. The women of Greenham Common, now permanently camped at the base, regard the deployment of crews as a turning point in the nuclear deterrent argument. The reason? The missiles are regarded as first strike weapons. The peace campaigners fear just that, a first strike in a so-called limited nuclear war in Europe. Greenham Common has become the front line in the campaign to prevent the deployment of the missiles. Um, so Greenham Common was one of a number of sites where nuclear weapons were deployed at that point. And I just want to say, um, don't you love his accent? You know, wasn't wasn't that just like, you know, there's something vaguely patronizing about it. Um, but the, the thing I did like about it was when he said um, there was almost a carnival atmosphere at first. And it took me straight back to 2019 and a friend saying to me, I said, oh, I'm surprised to see you here. Why are you here? And he said, he said, why would I miss the greatest party going? Um, and that's that's been that was then, wasn't it? And we did it again at G7. XR did it again at G7 in all sorts of ways. Uh, so let's keep the carnival um, and let's uh, let's keep uh, our courage together with uh, the idea that solidarity and having a good time is really important. Next clip, please. from the demonstration <laughs> and told to run the crash. <laughs> prepare the food and keep out of the way. <laughs> at, at dawn, marquees and tents began to be built at each of the eight gates into the base. The men were confined to, eight, to gate eight, <laughs> making such things as wax torches and sandwiches. <laughs> Working as if on a conveyor belt, they made more than 3,000 Marmite sandwiches. <laughs> In wholemeal bread, to <laughs> the needy. Among the first recipients were six coachloads of women from Edinburgh who had set off at 10 p.m. the night before. <laughs> It was snowing hard when they arrived, and the organisers feared that many people would be put off coming to Greenham. Oh, right. so I got in and had a better than the first green gate, but uh, gate 5 and gap A, uh, they've, got, they've got a few police there and they still think something's going to happen, and if there's, you feel there's enough women to send on, could they have some support for something?
Um, so yeah, um, Green and Common, um, uh, as, you, as you saw more towards the end of that clip, um, it, started, uh, it started just as a, a, an occupation protest. I shouldn't say just, it was an occupation protest. Um, and it also included um, a number of different actions that happened, one of which was the infamous um, Embrace the Base action um, in which people completely encircled the nine mile perimeter fence um, uh, that held the, the US um, base that was in there. Uh, what, one of a number of American bases right across the country at that time. Um, and um, so some women, uh, including myself, lived there permanently for a time. I lived there for six months and others like Di um, visited for actions um, and also supported in all sorts of practical ways, including um, bringing food and, and especially chocolate and um, also uh, doing the night watches, which, which were needed at times because we'd get vigilantes attacking us from the nearby town. Um, so the camp became an established feature and even a recognized address, which was confirmed by the fact that um, all the camps received post, um, usually by the same regular postman, even though there was no actual letterbox um, and water could be obtained by accessing mains water using a standpipe at the main gate. Um, but just living at the camp was hugely significant in a growing understanding of, of nonviolence and opposition to nuclear weapons, um, but also of what it means to be a woman. Um, so after the first year of the mixed gender camp, because as you would have seen in the, in the, in the march, you know, there were, was men there at first and um, then it was decided that the men should leave so that sounds rather harsh but it was an incredibly important part of the the women's liberation movement at the time um, and it was seen not as excluding men but as including women um, so this was a chance for women to really push out the boundaries of what it meant to be a woman um, and to 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 find a way to define ourselves um, away from the context of men and patriarchy. Um, and I still think um, that it's a good idea for, for genders to find themselves in separate uh, spaces, N not all the time, but, but sometimes it's, it's a good thing to do, I think. Um, so, so my life was, was typical of many women who went to Greenham. It was an absolute personal revolution and everything, as in the revolution, everything had to change. So my, my life was turned upside down um, I uh, had a breakup of my relationship with my boyfriend and uh, I don't know if you can see this clearly enough but this is this is what I looked like um, about a year before I went to Greenham um, so um, yeah so so many women left their their homes and their lives to be at Greenham um, and then they carried it all home again and into the world so the significance of that photo that I showed you is that um, even just wearing clothes at Greenham became something liberating. Um, so sometimes women would wear men's clothes because the range of outdoor clothes for women was so limited at the time um, and uh, not, not having to appear as feminine, not smelling perfumed or wearing makeup, um, even not washing actually, I found <laughs> incredibly liberating. Um, and many women uh, cropped their hair short and some women even shaved their heads. So this is a photo of me with a shaved head. Um, I shaved my, my head at Greenham. Um, and um, many women, including myself, came out as, as a lesbian and it was very easy actually to come out at Greenham because being lesbian wasn't just accepted, it was normal and it was even embraced. Um, and the, the um, effects of patriarchy uh, could be seen everywhere. Um, and there was this confrontation between us as camps outside the military uh, base and then the military inside. So certainly the military was seen as an extreme manifestation, manifestation. <laughs> All this is similar to how we rebels see carbon addiction excesses everywhere. Um, uh, when you've been involved with the, the, the climate and 
ecological emergency, you do start to, to notice it all the time. Um, so also um, ecofeminism emerged at this time, um, perceiving both women and nature as being oppressed by the patriarchy. And a, a significant aspect for me was that women of, of different faiths came and um, held ceremonies and rituals, and there was the decorating of the fence and weaving woolen webs everywhere to show how we're interlinked with all of nature. And just the discovering and creating um, of the fullness of our intentions and our commitment to stay there um, through all of that time um, and to uh, deeply participate. It wasn't just being there, it was bringing all of our authentic selves, our body, heart and soul to challenge militarism and patriarchy and to expose it. Um, and nonviolence has practiced as more than a strategy, but as a principle. So upholding higher values of love and truth, uh, trust, duty, courage and beauty. And also as a way to be, as well as just to do. Um, and all of, all of this was enriching our lives uh, and making them feel truly worthwhile and, and even as something sacred um, as women acting to protect all life on earth. And in this time, we also, of course, discovered the power of nonviolent civil disobedience, also as something beautiful and inspiring and uplifting and bringing out the best of what it is to be women and to be human. And through all this, very much bringing a sense of meaning into our lives. So there were many actions, mobilizing thousands of women answering that call. Um, it brought women from all over the UK and even from all over the world. Um, most women were white, but there was some diversity. And an example of that is that the miners' wives um, came to visit Greenham and Green, Greenham women went and linked up with the miners' strike and supported it. Um, so women were staying there through months and all seasons, um, including winter when your, tooth, uh, your toothpaste froze um, and you had to knock the ice off your survival bag. Um, and also in year, for, for years, um, the first four probably being most significant um, and important to note that movements have a shelf life. So we need to get on with it. Um, and taking action again and again, um, breaking into the base, blockading the missile convoys and getting onto the runway of the military planes, escalating actions, filling the courts and filling the prisons, which is familiar to us. So um, I want to tell you about three of my most memorable actions that I, I recall. Um, so one was uh, during a freezing cold winter early morning during our breakfast, um, the missile convoy suddenly came out of the gate and women had to react fast and spontaneously. So they, they grabbed this huge pan of porridge from the fire and then threw it across the window, the porridge that is not the pan, um, of the front uh, convoy vehicle. And the thick porridge then, of course, got nicely spread by the window wipers that were groaning. Um, and then, of course, it froze solid and it was impossible for the driver to, to see through and it took them ages to get it off. So it was a great women's way to stop a, con a nuclear convoy. Um, uh, the second um, action I want to tell you about is um, during one of the big actions at Greenham, um, um, and there was a big blockade in which the mounted police, uh, there was a lot of horses there, um, and the mounted police were actually backing their horses into the women who were blockading. And this is extremely dangerous because although horses will try to avoid you, if they're going forwards, uh, 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 made to go forwards into you, um, uh, they can't uh, avoid you if they're, if they're get, uh, being made to, to go backwards. So very dangerous. Um, and um, after the action, there was a couple of policemen and their horses that somehow got left behind. Um, and so what did we do? Well, we, we made them cups of tea and we shared our food with them. And they, in their turn, gave us rides on their horses, um, led, led women up and down. And um, the guy, guy of the horse that I rode, he could see that I could ride 
And so he invited me to go for a gallop. So here's a picture of me on this beautiful white police horse. Um, you can't really see the truncheon, but the truncheon there at my side and the radio. Um, and that was, um, you can see a woman looking very surprised in the background uh, um, in her sleeping bag. I hope you can see that. Um, so yeah, that was uh, amazing. And, and then finally, um, one Hiroshima day, which we always used to mark, um, women formed a naked blockade at the main gate. Um, so they were naked, but their bodies were covered with blood, real blood and ashes from the heart of the fires. And it was a most solemn and, and deeply moving action. And the police um, seemed to find it really challenging. Um, it was hard enough for them to deal with, with women anyway, uh, but this was beyond them. Um, so yeah, there's, there's three actions. And now we've got another clip um, from Greenham coming up. There were times when we, we thought they might shoot us. When we first went to, to cut the fence, you know, we didn't, we had no idea what would happen. I mean, if you know, what is this in aid of? Is this to prevent us getting in or you lot getting out? Yeah, Hundred percent security is impossible unless you had a man every sort of five meters, and there is no way any base could sustain that. The police women were definitely seen as an irritant. We did tend to know when things were going to happen, um, so there would be perhaps a larger presence in normal. But of course, you know, you could you could never fully secure the base. I think our experience has shown how impossible it is to prevent individual groups of people intent on committing criminal offences faced with the inevitability of arrest of doing so. I think that the deterrent factor of certainty of detection no longer applies in these circumstances. If I were to have sufficient police officers to ensure that no criminal offence was committed, I would require approximately 15,000 people every day. I can remember the discussions that went on for about two years about whether to cut the fence or not, whether this would be a violent action or not. When we realised, well, we could do it, we then thought, you know, well, what are the repercussions going to be? By then it was obvious that you could be arrested for criminal damage or whatever. And we got to the motorway service station and stopped and, and sat down for tea and a bun. And that was the moment at which we thought, actually, we're going to have to go through with this because they're not going to stop us. You know, they don't know we're coming. They're not here. There's no roadblock. We're going to get to Greenham and cut the fence down. We had this code of black cardigans, you know, on the phone to each other. Have you got your black cardigan yet? And, I mean, it really, really showed the strength of the Greenham organisation because the way that it was done, it was word of mouth and it was don't tell anyone that you don't really trust. And that sense that we had of who we could trust, it turned out to be 100% foolproof because they didn't know we were going. And that in spite of the fact that we bought up every pair of bolt cutters in London. I mean, I don't know how they didn't notice that. I mean, it's kind of worrying in a way. We had huge amounts of fun in the end. We didn't think we were going to, but we discovered how to use bolt cutters. And we cut through the barbed wire and we cut through the fence and we opened windows and doors into the base again and again and again. The idea was to, to keep it in the public eye and to try and get some reporting, if possible, some letting people know that that the base was there and it was not that secure. I think the single most important thing that it gave me was, was an understanding that, that rules aren't necessarily to be kept and that this kind of good little English girl 
act can stop you from doing an awful lot of things. And it made me understand that anything that you want to do and that you can see the point of, you can actually just go ahead and do it and keep doing it until somebody physically comes and stops you. Faced with a government that had airlifted in American cruise missiles against the wishes of the majority of the population, women's frustration erupted into action. Well, have you seen pictures of bodies all burnt? Imagine it's you and your family so hurt. We can stop the madness, but we must do it now. So come down to Greenham, take a fence down at Greenham. We won't move from Greenham, for time's running out. So, um... Yes, this is very um, topical for us. Um, the decision over cutting the fence had um, wider ramifications for activism at that time. Um, and it, it continues to, uh, up to our time, uh, as we've, we've had quite recently in Extinction Rebellion. Um, so um, this was the first access, um, acceptable uh, damage to property, acceptable by the majority of people, I think, um, in, in, at least in the movements, and I think in the wider public as well. So the fence was seen as, as part of the whole of the military base, um, but it provoked a great deal of discussion about nonviolence and whether this actually count, counted. Um, and it, it really widened the Overton window um, in the in the discussion about what can constitute nonviolence, um, and the discussion continued um, into uh, subsequent actions by the Swords into Plowshares movement, which um, did the accountable disarming of weapons, um, and which included a um, a women's plowshares action uh, um, of which I was part, uh, the Seeds of Hope plowshares. Um, which disarmed a Hawk warplane worth 13 million pounds, totally destroyed, that was bound for gen genocide in East Timor. And this resulted in a, um, a Liverpool jury um, endorsing the fact that not only uh, can um, property damage be um, non-violent, but it can also be seen as, as legal. Um, uh, and so they gave this not amazing, historic, uh, not guilty verdict. Um, and it also was given the Sean McBride Peace Prize. So this caused quite a breakthrough in attitudes towards property damage being seen as, as non-violent. Um, so uh, just to, to sum up um, this, uh, the Greenham episode, what was achieved? Um, there was the exposing of the link between patriarchy and militarism, um, that we kicked out all the US military bases and closed down the US runway Britain. Um, we reclaimed the common, salute to the levelers. Um, there there's a memorial now on the common as well to the Green and women. Um, and it was a cresting of a great wave of femi feminism during the 80s. And there are many more ripples that, that went out that we we can't even know about or, or follow um, because we don't often see the results of, of our or, or the impact of our actions. Um, but um, uh, about 20 years ago, I was able to, to get a, a result that I didn't expect. During my involvement with pulling up genetically modified crops, another example of property damage, um, and I was contacted by a young man called Nick to help with a recce of a GM crop field. So whilst we were chatting during our recce, we realised that both of us had been present at Greenham, but on different sides of the fence. Um, Mick was just 18 years old when he was stationed at Greenham, and he carefully collected and kept all the Greenham leaflets and decorated the wall next to his bunk with them. Um, and then 15 years later, still inspired by the Greenham women, he became a GM crop puller. And now, of course, 20 years on, He's a, an XR rebel. So that's a nice little story about a ripple that went out. Um, and now we're back to Di and she's gonna tell us about the suffragettes. 
thanks, um, Rowan. Uh, before I do that, okay, um, I'm just I'm just going to show you the blue plaque equivalent uh, for feminists, okay? So this, my dears, is a piece of the fence, and um, I didn't even know it was in our house um, because uh, my I live with Ruth, my partner, and uh, I'm a thrower outer and she's a keeper. Hence the continuing existence of this. And uh, I went to the fence cutting with the butchest pair of bolt covers you've ever cutters you've ever seen in your life. And I can remember now trying to walk with these meter long bolt covers down my jeans, holding onto them in the pocket. But actually, they just didn't know we were coming, uh, as was said. So I could have just walked in, you know, swinging it around. Um, and last, um, I just want to show you embrace the base. Okay, so there's my daughters, Kate and Rebecca in the hats and Rahina, my foster daughter in front. So that was uh, that was them uh, decorating the face and uh, the base and embracing the base. And the, the link to the suffragettes is is pretty uh, apparent, I think. Um, it, it, lots of women at Greenham and lots of us who were part of the that wave of feminism took our inspiration from the suffragettes um, and we we took it in spite of the fact that they were largely white middle class women um, there were uh, working class suffragettes particularly in Manchester and this is a plug for the film suffragette if you haven't seen it because it was bloody impossible if you were a working class suffragette to keep your family and friends and in many cases even your children uh, were you know you'd be it would be so unpopular and they would be removed from you um, so um, I just want to briefly um, say something from from Mrs Pankhurst so the the women had been haranguing parliament and doing all sorts of things um, they weren't non-violent in the sense that their property, dis uh, their property destruction sometimes risked uh, stuff to people. So blowing up pillar boxes is okay, isn't it? Unless there happens to be anybody walking by. So when I'm just reading this uh, clip from Mrs. Pankhurst, I'd like you to think of militancy, not as militancy in the suffragette sense, but in activism in the nonviolent sense that we understand it. And what had happened is the prime minister had more or less given a promise that a piece of legislation would go through parliament, which would result in women being given the vote. Um, so this is Mrs. Pankhurst said, I'm gonna call it the women's union because the women's social and political union is too much of a mouthful. Uh, the women's union has refused to call a truce on the basis of the prime minister's promise and has refused to depend on the amendments in question. Well, sounds familiar, I hope. The government has not told us that they will become law. That's the amendments. Every member of the union knows that defeat of the amendments will make militancy a moral duty. It will be a political necessity. We must prepare ourselves now. There are different levels of militancy. Some women are able to go further than others. To be militant in some way is a moral obligation. Every woman owes this to her own conscience and her self-respect and future generations of women. And that was just talking about the vote, not about the future of life on earth. So we're going to go into the suffragettes now. The next clip is pretty harrowing. It's uh, an actor uh, reading Mary Richardson's words about, it was a true account of what being force fed in prison was like. Forcible feeding is, to my mind, one of the worst forms of torture imaginable. The attack is brutal, the method primitive. When I was first forcibly fed, 
I offered only passive resistance. But after a few days, the process became so degrading, so morally staining to me, as well as increasingly painful, that I was obliged to resist. The struggle with ten wardresses is severe, and in it the arms and legs are twisted and the hands badly cut by the wardress's nails. After these ten wardresses had overcome me and thrown me violently on the bed, three of them lay full weight across my legs. My knees are still painful, and I cannot go up or downstairs without difficulty. On several occasions, wardresses fell on top of me on the floor, once so severely injuring my ribs that I could not lie in bed on my left side for several days. Twice my head was thrown against the wall of the cell, owing to my feet being taken from under me violently. My face was blackened and swollen from this, even after my release from prison. The process of driving the tube through the nose is very terrible, as the tube is usually too large for the nasal cavity. And when there appears any obstruction, more and more violent pushing is resorted to. On one occasion, Dr. Pearson almost tore my nose in his repeated efforts to force the tube through the opening. After 30 times of nasal feeding, my face, eyes and nose were so swollen and bruised that Dr. Pearson brought in a home office specialist. And after consultation, he announced that he would feed me by the throat tube thereafter. I refused to be so fed and set my teeth together, whereupon he ran his second finger through my lips, cutting them, and then finding the extremity of my jaw, he deliberately cut my cheek with his fingernail. I cried out at his cruelty, but he continued until, in agony, my teeth were parted and a metal spring gag inserted, followed by the feeding tube. By this time, the blood from my cut cheek and gums was running from the corner of my mouth, down the neck, into my clothing, and I began to choke violently. The pain of this operation was beyond my endurance. I was driven almost mad by it, and springing off the bed, when they had left off holding me, I ran out of my cell. Dr Pearson said I was in a dangerous state of mind and must be treated accordingly with the result that they refused to open my cell door when I needed anything and contented themselves with shouting at me as they would to a lunatic. The following day, Dr Pearson told me he had decided to return to nasal feeding and I was fed accordingly until I was discharged four days later owing to an attack of appendicitis. This was brought on by the hospital treatment I had been receiving. Yeah, um, I think we can say that prison is now relatively an easy and safe place, at least for white women um, in Britain, um, in comparison to what the suffragettes experienced. It's a really harrowing account. Um, not so for BIPOC women, um, black or uh, black indigenous people of color women. Um, who are still disproportionately mistreated, refuse medical attention, um, uh, given excessive punishment and more. Um, Sarah Reed is the most recent um, woman of color to, to, to die after mistreatment in 2016. Um, Sylvia Pankhurst was notable as a, a, a rarity um, in being actively an, anti-racist amongst the suffragettes who were um, otherwise sadly rather typical of their time. Um, maybe uh, we can't expect more of them uh, given, given the, the climate of that time. Um, uh, but the film, The Suffragette, um, uh, or rather it's called just Suffragette, I think, um, it does show how working class women contributed in the face of general hostility from um, employers and neighbors and family and and most public opinion. Um, the next clip shows the, the final tragedy that sealed the, the victory of votes for women. The King's horse in this unhappy incident is running third from last. <laughs> I 
Okay, so that was Emily Davidson being killed by the King's horse. And we don't know, uh, she didn't leave anything, uh, whether she expected to be killed or whether she was just attaching, just attaching, <laughs> whether she was trying to attach a suffragette uh, uh, scarf to the saddle, but whatever, um, she died. Um, so Ryan made the point about prison being a soft option, really, compared to um, compared to then for us. Um, and I also would like to say that women in prison are having a softer option time at the moment, currently, uh, than men. You know, better bronze field than Wormwood Scrubs, guys. Um, and the, the same applies to a number of other men's prisons, which are awful places to be. I can see somebody's got a deeds, not words up. That's a suffragette quote. Um, to, to take the action that we need to do in this most parlous of times. Um, and then I think the last clips, we're just letting speak for themselves. Is that right, Rowan? By way of introducing the next two clips, um, I think XR's crowning contribution in the latest of women's actions, the breaking glass actions, which we'll see in the moment, um, following the suffragettes who also broke windows. Um, so the XR women were dressed in costume with suffragette colors of purple, purple, white, and green, um, and also called one of their actions after the famous Millicent Fawcett quote, courage calls to courage everywhere. Uh, so they were also inspired by the women's plowshares action, the Seeds of Hope plowshares, um, and that these uh, breaking, act uh, breaking windows actions were an inspiring tribute to the history of women's struggle and um, our hero, heroes, heroes um, bringing them present to the struggle of our time so we can feel ourselves embraced by their fierce love and courage. Um, and uh, also that these XR women rebels were also stretching the Everton window on property damage as non-violent showing the importance of being accountable, um, uh, which helps people's understanding of what would otherwise be seen as extreme. And also how the context is so important that when actions are framed in terms of, in case of emergency break glass, people have a, an understanding um, of, you know, something that people can relate to because they see it on buses and buildings and so on. Um, and it helps them to understand um, what otherwise would, would not be uh, understandable. And finally, just wanted to say as a closing, um, before we see this, uh, this last clip, um, that it's all hands on all decks, all decks. So um, to invite you to come to the August Rebellion and also to sign up to the Insulate Britain campaign. Do both because we need to do both. Um, and then you can enjoy a well-earned break, possibly in prison. <laughs> Okay, so the last, the last clips, the last, yeah, two clips we've got now. Barclays are the biggest funders of fossil fuels in Europe. HSBC have invested £80 billion in the last five years. They are selling our future and people in the global south are suffering now. They're killing us, but they're trying to convince us that they're not. I just want to bring you some pictures that we're getting from Canary Wharf in East London, where Extinction Rebellion climate protesters have gathered and were responsible for shattering at least 19 windows at one of the towers there, this one, the HSBC headquarters. The harm of a broken window pales in comparison to the harm these companies are doing to us, our children and our grandchildren. This is only about a week or so ago that actually Extinction Rebellion uh, broke windows on the Barclays Bank building. Courage calls to courage everywhere. When I was walking here this morning I was like crying on the tube. But it wasn't because of this horrible situation, it's because I was thinking of you guys being here. We love you, boy. I thought, thank fuck, you know, I'm not the only one who's like, who gets it and who's willing to do something. And I feel so much braver doing it with you. And. She had something when she said courage calls to courage everywhere, because <laughs> it does.
and what they did at Barclays the other week that called to my courage. Yeah. And hopefully our courage will call to other people's yeah. courage. Yeah. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine.